In our increasingly electrified society, that's where a resilient grid matters most. ITC Great Plains builds, operates, and maintains electric transmission infrastructure, connecting consumers to lower cost energy sources to power our energy future. That means safe, secure, reliable electricity for those we serve. Learn more at itc-holdings.com. on this Friday evening, live from Smoky Hills PBS in Bunker Hill. I'm your host, Becky Kaiser. We're so glad that you joined us this evening, and we want to say thank you to our partners, ITC, and also the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort Hayes State University for making our live programming possible this evening. Again, I'm Becky Kaiser. I'm from Hayes. I work for Eagle Communications, Eagle Radio, and Hayes Post. And we are delighted to have three of our Western Kansas legislators with us this evening to talk about what's been going on in Topeka, just finishing up the fourth week. I would like to have uh, introduced to you the closest to me is Senator Rick Billinger, of course, Republican from the 40th District of Goodland. And then across the table from me this evening is Republican Representative Dr. Bill Clifford, District 122 of Garden City. And also joining us this evening next to him is Republican Representative Adam Smith from District 120 in Weskin in Western Kansas. And Senator Billinger, let's start with you. If you will remind everyone a little bit about yourself, tell us a little bit about about yourself, committee assignments that you're working on so far, and topics that you think are going to be pretty exciting this legislative session. Well, th thank you, Becky. Uh, I'll just uh, start out with, uh, my name's Rick Billinger, and I do live in Goodland, and I represent the 40th district, which is the largest Senate district in the state of Kansas, uh, 14 uh, counties, and uh, I represent uh, Wallace, Logan, Gove, Trigo, Ellis, Graham, Sheridan, Thomas, Sherman, Cheyenne, Decatur, Rollins, Norton, and Phillips. You have that memorized. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, the only committee I serve on uh, during the session is the uh, Senate Ways and Means. So I do the budget work in the Senate. And uh, we started with budgets on Wednesday of this week and we had uh, subcommittees met and we had uh, report outs today and uh, we're hoping to get through that process uh, by the first week in March, hoping to try to get our budget on the floor by the 14th of March, which is similar to where we were last year. And uh, we're focusing on tr trying to figure out where we can do some one-time spending again, similar to last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking to uh, look for debt reduction. We look for uh, p possible bonding payoffs. Uh, we're looking at some bonding where we may uh, uh, offset bonds with bonds that are higher now and try to, you know, uh, take some gains on the arbitrage. And so we're looking at some of that. We're looking at uh, uh, places where we, we're trying to in, invest. Uh, last year, we invested a lot of uh, money into our regents, our colleges. And um, I, I do have a bill this year that uh, we're trying to uh, uh, address deferred maintenance. Deferred maintenance at our universities is a billion two hundred million dollars. Wow! And uh, so we're we're trying to figure that out. Is that basically physical the facilities? Yes, facilities. Yes, and uh, also we we put quite a little funding in last year for demolition, and we will be looking at doing that again this year. Uh, we're looking at capers. Uh, we've we've made tremendous strides in, in, in our CAPERS uh, system. 
but uh, we still have a ways to go, so we're, we're looking at trying to shore that up some more. Um, quite a few different things, you know, that we're, we're, we're working on, um, particularly in, in the west part of the district. Uh, we've, we've got a community that's uh, we're trying to adjust uh, for the county commissioners, their appointments to hospital boards, because uh, currently if, if you are on a hospital board, like in, say, Waukini, and you would move out of the county, which you say you lived on the county line between Ellis and Trigo, you'd have to give up your, your seat on the board. Mm -hmm. And um, in the smaller communities are having a hard time anyway keeping folks on these boards. I mean, they don't get paid or anything, and so it's volunteer. all volunteer. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a couple situations, or one in particular, where uh, um, one of the uh, board members has just moved across the county line, not very far from the city, and, and th this will allow c county commissioners the option of uh, going ahead and uh, appointing someone on a county that is next door. So if, if you lived in, in uh, Trigo and, and you, you wanted to put somebody on the board or you had somebody on the board that just moved into Ellis County, they would still be able to appoint someone within their boundaries or counties that surround them. That seems logical, especially yeah. in rural areas yeah. where, you know, smaller towns and further apart. Yep. Yeah. And the other interesting bill we have uh, is for the broadcasters. Um, uh, Keisha has uh, made an agreement with some outfit out of Georgia and uh, some of our local broadcasters have been broadcasting for years and years and uh, they might show up to do a game and, and not be able to broadcast to, you know, the, especially our smaller communities. I know that's happened to us at Eagle Radio and, uh, and not only is it frustrating to us, but boy, the people who want to hear and see those games, they get frustrated. Sure. So we're, we're trying to fix that. Good, good. We hope we're able to do that. We want to remind you, of course, that we are live this evening and want to hear from you about any questions or comments that you might have for the legislators this evening. That 800 number you can call toll-free, 1-800-337-4788. Well, let's move on now and talk to uh, Dr. Clifford, Representative Clifford uh, in Garden City. And you tell us a little bit about yourself, remind us about yourself and the committees that you serve on and what you're looking toward towards this session, Bill. Well, thanks, uh, Becky. Uh, as you know, I'm an eye surgeon in uh, Garden City. I live in Finney County, just south of Garden City. I uh, represent the 122nd District that you mentioned before, Kearney, Finney, Hodgman, and half of Pawnee, just up to the State mm -hmm. Hospital. A couple of precincts in Edwards County, too, north of uh, Kinsley. Um, as you know, uh, I was here last year, but I was serving the term of uh, the late Russ Jennings. So this is my first biennium. I'm uh, elected for two years. so. It's certainly a different feel in the legislature than, than finishing out uh, the end of a biennium. Uh, we have over 400 bills uh, alone in the House side, mm. uh, and there's a lot of activity uh, and a lot of interest in education and, and capers, as the senator said, in, in trying to pay down some of the state debt, too, since we, we still have a surplus and, and tax revenues have, have to continue to exceed uh, expectations. Uh, I'm on the health committee as a physician. I, I think it's appropriate to be there, and fortunately leadership kept me on it. I'm also on the social services budget committee. Um, our all-in-state budget, and you'll hear from these gentlemen, it's probably about nine, close to nine billion. Our committee has eight billion. Most of that's federal funds. So the all-in budget of Kansas is 22 to 23 billion. We have eight of that in our one committee. Of course, we have to hand our recommendations to the to the appropriators. Uh, finally, I'm on the uh, Financial Institutions and Pensions Committee. So again, uh, quite concerned about capers, uh, looking at things like uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, we passed legislation last uh, session, which was a first in the nation bill to create a what's called a TEFI, or a, a Technology Enhanced uh, Financial institu Institution, which uh, handles assets which are hard to uh, liquidate or uh, very well-heeled investors. So it's bringing a lot of money to Kansas, but uh, we're learning uh, about how the TEFIs work, and uh, we've heard from the bank commissioner uh, his concern, so we might see some legislation there. All right, and then also, 
We want to hear from Representative Smith from Weskin to talk a little bit about yourself and if you would tell us about your committees. And you're the tax man. We, yeah, you're just, you told us before we got on air what it's already like. Yes, well thank you Becky and I, first of all I want to start off with thanking you, uh, thanking Smoky Hills Public Television, uh, ITC and the Docking Institute for hosting this show. This is, I don't know about these gentlemen, but this is always my favorite time of the, of the week, uh, getting to come on here and, oh, and good. Keep, keep, uh, keep in contact and communicate with the folks it's back home. And yes. I go home every weekend and I talk to as many people as I can at, at the basketball games and things, but this really reaches a great audience, so thank you for what you do. Um, as you said, my name is Adam Smith. I represent the 120th district in Northwest Kansas. That's six counties. Uh, I don't have all mine memorized. No, I, I do. But <laughs> <laughs> you will, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, you know, with redistricting, last the last uh, three terms, I've represented just a portion of Thomas County. So now I have, I can say I have, I have six full counties okay. now that I represent. I got the rest of Thomas County to balance out for redistricting. But um, I serve on the tax committee. I, I chair that committee. I also serve on federal and state affairs and the, the Rules Committee for the House, and also uh, new this year, I've never been on this committee before, is Corrections and Juvenile Justice. Mm -hmm. So it's, even as a, this is my seventh year in the legislature, and I'm, I'm still learning new things, so. Um, some of the, I think the term you used was exciting, I don't know if I would qualify that here, but <laughs> some of the, the large issues that are being discussed in the Tax Committee, uh, is a, a single moving to a single rate income tax structure right now we have three different tiers uh, the first tier is a 3.1 percent uh, income tax rate on the first fifteen thousand dollars from then fifteen to thirty thousand dollars it's five point two five and then anything over uh, thirty thousand dollars and i'm talking about uh, single so if it's married filing mm -hmm. joint that's that's double but uh, anything that top tier is at five point seven so with, with the revenue, uh, we're, the, the surplus that's been mentioned, we're looking at trying to figure out a way to just make one consistent rate for all and try to balance that out a little bit better. Uh, that's something that we looked at when I came in in 2017 and we were uh, really looking at some tax reform on income tax policy at that time. Of course, at that point, we couldn't really afford uh, some of the costs that it would take uh, in order to uh, make sure that that lower bracket doesn't receive a tax increase. We'll need to modify the, the standard deduction, uh, some of the, the the benefits, the tax credits and things for, for lower income individuals so they don't is, receive a tax Is flat tax rate credit. very common? Do other states do that? You know, I should have brought that data in here. There there have been a lot of states that have moved, moved towards that with the, the surplus. The, the, the surplus isn't unique to Kansas. That happened all across the nation. All of the states with the influx of money from the, the COVID right. um, relief funds, it really ended up being a, a stimulus to the economy. Uh, state budgets are, are very, very well right now, doing very well, uh, lots of revenues. The revenue is, is declining. Uh, that the effects of that is kind of, are kind of starting to trickle off a little bit, but, but it's still impacting revenues. So a lot of states decided to make several different uh, tax cuts in, in place of that policy, whether it was sales tax rate reduction. Uh, a lot of people um, did a fuel tax uh, holiday for a certain time. Um, but a lot of states did move to that, that single rate, kind of a flat rate uh, income tax structure. So Kansas is looking at that and what that would entail. Uh, a couple of other things, uh, some of the big topics that's getting some discussion in tax is accelerating the reduction in the food sales tax rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a big debate last year. Uh, we currently are at 4%. Last year we were at the full state rate of 6.5%, which I think uh, at that time we were, uh, I think the, the highest and one of the highest in the nation at 6.5 on food. So we, we cut that to 4%. It is scheduled to go down another 2% next January and then be phased out the year after that. Uh, there's several ideas, several different bills out there that would go ahead and accelerate that uh, to zero this year. We'll have to see where the, the fiscal note comes in mm -hmm. on that to see how much money it would take from, from the budget and the, the revenue process to do that immediately. But that, just like last year, that's a very popular one. I, I hear a lot about that and um, we'll probably look to, to take some action on that and see what it would cost. 
the next one that has been talked about every single year I've been down in the legislature, we've just never been able to afford to do it and put a plan in place, is exempting the income tax on Social Security benefits. Uh, Kansas is one of the very few states that still taxes uh, Social Security benefits and it's it's time that we take a look at that this has bipartisan support uh, we had an interim committee actually a joint committee between the Senate and House tax and this was it was bicameral the Senate and the House both agreed we needed to take a look at this uh, Republicans Democrats were all on the same page uh, it seems like an I ideal time to take a look at that uh, Right now we have a tax cliff that catches a lot of people off guard. The threshold is $75,000 and it doesn't matter if you're single or mar married filing joint, if your federal adjusted gross income is below $75,000, none of your benefits are taxable, your Social Security benefits. Once you make $1 more and you cross that threshold, they are all 100% taxable. Mm. So. It's, it's, as you can imagine, it's a little bit of a shock. You know, the, the average benefit uh, in Kansas is about $18,000 to $20,000 a year. Um, it's obviously going to fluctuate up and down, but that's kind of the average benefit. You take the tax on that, and it, it could really be a surprise to you uh, on April 15th when you're doing your taxes and you don't realize that you'd cross that threshold. So uh, we're trying to smooth that cliff down and take a look at what it would cost to actually completely eliminate the income tax on on that hopefully make it a little bit easier for our seniors to stay in Kansas yeah, I, and absolutely retire here we'll keep abreast of that we want to go to the telephone now we have uh, Roy from Colby is joining us and Roy you have a question or a comment for our legislators this evening yes I do go right ahead okay uh, I would like all three of the legislators to comment on the water situation in the Ogallala? That is quite the topic and there, there's been, it's always been of concern in western Kansas but I think the awareness of it is growing gentlemen and I know you all are involved in the situation in different ways. Uh, let's talk first of all with uh, Representative Clifford being out in Garden City and in that area uh, there where there's a lot of irrigation that goes on for ag what is the sure. situation well it's the lifeblood and uh, we've got to protect our, our asset we've been mining the Okalala for for decades mm -hmm. uh, I think we're quite fortunate in Western Kansas that uh, representative Jim Minix from Scott City who's a rancher there is the chair of the House Water Committee um, I've been fortunate to have enough time as a new legislator to go to the Water Committee meetings even though I'm not on water and uh, last year was fascinating uh, with Representative Ron Highland uh, bringing a 260 page bill to totally revamp how water is dealt with in Kansas. Uh, that was not well received by, by ag in particular, by our irrigators, uh, so it did not move last year. Uh, Representative Minix uh, is taking a much more conservative approach. He's listening to people really well and I think his committee will create uh, mainly tweaks in the area of conservation. Uh, we've had all the GMDs uh, come in, groundwater management districts mm -hmm. come in. Uh, there's been great success up in Northwest Kansas uh, uh, with a, a Lima up there. And uh, I think folks are starting to take notice that they can do things uh, with less water uh, and still uh, make a profit and, and a, a very good profit at that. So uh, this involves, of course, crop rotation, the different soils we, ha we have. It's, very complex, but uh, I, I, there's money uh, in the budget for water. We fully funded the water plant last year. And, and it hadn't been for a while, right? It had Is not been for, for many years, exactly. So, uh, and that's pleasing uh, both Eastern and Western Kansas. Uh, I mean, in the East, it's mainly surface water and, and the reservoirs, uh, Senator Billing here talked about f uh, buying down the debt. Some of that is to pay off uh, what we owe the Corps of Engineers to store our water. It's Kansas's water, but the feds built the dam, so we owe them, and we're using that to reduce debt service. But also fill, fulfilling the water plan will allow dredging of the reservoirs and improvement of stream banks and, and a much better, uh, higher quality supply. So it concerns the entire state. Uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. So, Dr. 
not, I just promoted you there, <laughs> <laughs> Representative Smith. Um, we hear, as I was saying, you know, we've all known about it in Western Kansas, but it's gone across the state, and there's a lot of uh, concern and awareness now nationwide about uh, the concern of, of water diminishing and how what a precious resource it is. And you being again from Western Kansas and discussion of the groundwater management districts and that things apparently can continue even if we're conserving water. What are people saying to you about it? Right, the, the biggest concern we hear uh, isn't always necessarily about quantity, it's also about quality. Uh, there are yes. a lot of areas in our state where the, the, the quality of the water is also being reduced um, to the point where it's, it's not even uh, able to be used for irrigation. So we need to, we need to balance uh, both of those, and that's, that's groundwater and, and surface water as well. But I, I, I'm hearing more and more. Uh, we heard, heard about the, the uranium issue down around Lakin and, and the Arkansas River Valley uh, water. We were also seeing that up in northwest Kansas, uh, up around Overland, uh, mm. Decatur County. There's, there's some situations where the water quality is, is going to become an issue. Um, for some, it's already here, and it's probably going to expand even more as that water table uh, gets down farther. Uh, the concentration of some of those materials gets a little bit higher, and we, we have to be concerned about that. You know, for the last two years, I, I was on the water committee. Um, Legislate in the House, we serve for a two-year term, and then we kind of get shuffled around depending on the need. Uh, so this year, I was not reappointed to the Water Committee. I, I um, was appointed to the Fed and State Committee. But you know, to Representative Clifford's point, last year we had a very large bill introduced. I think it was on a Thursday or a Friday, and we began working on that bill the very next week. And it was toward the end of the session. It was a major comprehensive plan. We had spent two years really educating the committee, learning all about the, the surface water, all the different issues, uh, surface water and the aquifer. And we had a good mix, and we do it again this year, of urban legislators, rural legislators, eastern Kansas, western Kansas. There's, there's a good mix on that committee, so we have all sides and all viewpoints. But, you know, that, that bill last year, I think, ultimately failed because it was trying to do too much too quick. We didn't have time to really dig into the details. Um, I don't think there's a bill yet in the Water Committee, but I think uh, Representative Minix, as, as Dr. Clifford had mentioned, is chairing that. Rather than trying to, to eat the whole elephant at once, let's, let's identify a few bites that are the biggest priority. Let's take care of those. Uh, and so I'm encouraged to see what the Water Committee can get done this year. And then remember, this is a biennium, so they, maybe they can make a few steps this year improve the things that are the highest priority, and then uh, he spends a lot of time educating the committee. Uh, I've got a lot of new members on there, so in order to make those decisions, they need good education and, and information about and how, how all the water works together, but um, this isn't just a once, one year thing. We've got good get background with that education to where maybe next year they can be a little more aggressive and go even farther on improving the quality and quantity of water. Of course, being from Hayes, uh, water, very precious resource in Hayes as well, because we're not part of the Ogallala, which I think some people don't realize. And, uh, and we know, of course, that it is being depleted as well at this, at this current rate anyway. But Rick, I wonder, it's, sometimes it seems like, and people say this, that there's the urban versus rural, the ag versus uh, cities battle of the water, which I hate to hear because we, you know, obviously we're an ag state, but we need to take care of our people too. Is there really that kind of uh, battle going on or do, is it becoming a little bit more, we're all in this together? No, I, I think you're correct. There, there's gonna be a urban uh, uh, battle uh, with rural. I mean, uh, today if you, if you ask some people that live in the eastern part of the state, uh, you know, their, their solution is quit irrigating altogether, just shut them off. Well, you know, economically that does not work. And water is a, a uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's something that you, when you buy the land, it, it goes with the land, you know. Right. And, it, and it's deeded, it's, it's, and I think as long as we work through our G, uh, GDMs, you know, GDM4, I think, um, one of the representatives mentioned, you know, uh, they have the Sheridan Six, which 
you know, the uh, Lima there mm -hmm. and how well that's worked. And, you know, I think, you know, we need to get, a, get to a place like Hayes. You know, Hayes has done a really good job the last 25 years in, in conserving water. I think that the last I seen, it's under 100 gallons a day per person in Hayes. I don't think there's another community in Kansas that could, can say that. We're number one. <laughs> you know, so, so you know, there, we need to look at all opportunities and we need to conserve any time we can. I, I know, you know, the uh, GMD4, they have rules. They, they have cut back on the amount of, of uh, gallons. They let, uh, you know, different parts of the, of the uh, uh, district pump, you know, and they adjust them according to how the, the water table is, is performing and getting to be more of these lemas and, 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 and more uh, uh, conservation uh, tools. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, just from a standpoint of the, the economic side of things, uh, the natural gas last summer was so much higher than it was the year before, mm -hmm. like triple. So, you know, if you had a thousand dollar bill a year ago, it was 3,000. You know, if you had a 10,000, it was 30,000. I don't think there's anyone that's going to pump any longer than they have to when they're paying them kind of gas bills, you know what I mean? And I'll guarantee you they're trying to make sure every drop of water is used wisely. So I, I just don't, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't get into this big fight between, you know, the East and the West and because, like I said, uh, um, there's been more than one have mentioned, you know, just shut it off, you know, which is not an option for Western Kansas. So. I, I, I'm hopeful that we'll see some progress, but I, I don't know because, uh, you know, it's a private property right, and I'm not sure we want folks in Topeka telling the irrigators in western Kansas, you know, what you can and can't do. I think it's best handled through the GMDs. A lot of different issues come together in what you were saying, Adam, about the education process. Hopefully that's part of it. Is when people are not around agriculture, they, they don't really have that understanding of why it's not feasible for Western Kansas. So we'll see what happens there. We have another phone caller uh, with us this evening, Bernie from Hayes. Do you have a comment or a question of our legislators this evening? Let's hear from you. Do we still have Bernie on the phone? Hi. Um, um. I'm, I'm from Hayes, Kansas, and I'm, uh, I've been a, a past a, a public servant of the state of Kansas. And um, um, I, I receive um, a W-2 every year. I just got one in the mail. And, you know, that's the same W-2 I've gotten since I retired some 16 years ago. And you, you guys have talked about increases in um, expenses. And of course, the, my Social Security benefit goes up, and and you are the people that um, that can give us a raise. Uh, you got any idea that might be a good idea? Would you thank us for our service a little bit? Would, well, would let's that start. be too much to ask? Let's start with you, Representative Smith. You were addressing that a little bit earlier. Right, and, and that's that's really a way to consider a, a raise in your 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 benefit would remain the same, but if it's not taxable on the Social Security benefits, uh, that can make a big difference. Uh, a little bit amount a, a little amount of money can go a long way. So, if we can make those benefits ultimately tax free, uh, that would be a, a big help, I think. There have been uh, one-time uh, contributions by the legislature to the Capers Pool. Uh, in the way of cost of living increases. But again, uh, CAPERS is a defined benefit plan. You know what you're going to get when you're in it. Uh, and there is not a, a cost of living adjustment. Uh, I agree with Representative Smith. One of the biggest things I hear from citizens and uh, farmers, uh, ranchers, is property tax relief. And we have a surplus. Uh, last year we concentrated on the food sales tax reduction funding the Rady Day Fund and shoring up capers with over a billion dollar investment. Uh, this year, we need to get property tax relief right. Uh, we former county commissioners, commissioners, of course, would like the demand transfers paid, 
which they haven't been paid for nearly 20 years to local entities. I don't think that's going to happen, but I do think if we can get a, across the board a reduction of the state mill levy, that will ha ha help everyone. So even if someone like Bernie isn't getting in an increase in his capers, if we can cut down his property tax expense, he gets a raise. The transfers that you were referring to, what is that exactly? Well, there were uh, deals, I'll say, or agreements years ago that the state would do certain things on behalf of local entities. For like, instance, a, a cigarette tax, rather than every municipality collecting that, the state would collect it all and then a portion would go back to a state or a county or, or a school district. Uh, the state decided for budgetary reasons early in the 2000s to stop transferring the money back. It's still state law, just in the budget each year, as, as Senator Billinger knows, there's a, an agreement that we won't fund that. Also for, for roads, there's another demand transfer. So these are statutory transfers back to local entities. Um, my sense, being a Western Kansas legislator, is that there are people in the legislature who don't trust local government. They don't trust that if they sent the money back to Finney County, it would be transferred to the citizens as property tax relief. Now, that's probably borne out by their experiences in Douglas County or Wyandotte County. But so if we just reduce the state mill levy, that bypasses the local entities, goes right to the taxpayer as property tax relief. And isn't Kansas pretty high compared to other states, the state mill? Well, depends where you, and uh, I would say not the state mill, but either you'd like to comment on that, or 20 plus one and a half, 21 and a half. What piles on for citizens is if you have a local hospital that needs 30 mills, if you have a community college, uh. if you have a school system that's expanding, uh, you start stacking those numbers and pretty soon your mill levy is, is pretty, pretty high. So, but I do think uh, that we can do something about the statewide mill levy in the way of property tax relief. Well, do you, are you seeing that in the Senate in your discussion, Senator Billing? Yes, I, I, first I'd like to answer Bernie's question. You sure. know, uh, Bernie, uh, you know, uh, there's been discussion in the past about COLAs, which is what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in 2018, uh, we had a bill in the Senate it was the first time in 25 years we paid the actual required contribution. And, you know, the Capers Fund was in terrible trouble for years because mm -hmm. it wasn't funded like it was supposed to be. So the first time was 2018 that we funded the actual required contribution. And we have, like Representative Clifford said, we have put extra money into to capers to shore it up. We put a billion last year, we put 500 million the year before, and we put a billion the year before that. Last year, when we got done with our, our funding on capers, we had got to 80%. Now that has been adjusted because of the rate of return was adjusted by the board at capers. So uh, we were using a seven and three quarter uh, return and they lowered that to 7%. So consequently, the 80% drop because we're getting, uh, we're using a, a lower uh, rate of return. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're not quite there, but we've worked very hard to get capers to a solvent position. And uh, Bernie, you can, you can we can guarantee you that you're gonna get every penny you was promised. That wasn't the case when I arrived in Topeka in 2011. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of them deals that Representative Clifford mentioned, you know, th there's nothing in there that says anything about a COLA. It's a defined benefit. And so, you know, at some point in time, we get this thing, you know, close to fully funded. You know, I, 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 that's been our focus, getting it funded rather than trying to, you know, send a little cola here or there. Sure. And, and I, we're still focused on trying to get this thing uh, 
you know, uh, fully funded. And you said that right at the beginning of our show. Again, I want to remind you that we are live this evening at Smoky Hills PBS in Bunker Hill. And if you have a question or a comment that you would like to make to any of our legislators this evening, you can call us toll free. That number is 1-800-337-4788. I want to go to something completely different that was in the news, to, is in the news today. And I heard a statement from uh, Governor Kelly and you're, you're nodding because you know what I'm going to ask over there, Representative Smith. Apparently, Northeast Kansas had a Chinese reconnaissance balloon floating over it earlier today and, it, and it's going across the United States. And there's debate about what kind of balloon it is. And, then, and the governor did contact somebody in the federal government to, you know, that she's very concerned about it. You guys concerned? What are, should we be worried about it? I don't know where it is right now, but earlier this evening it had gone across northeast Kansas, northwest Missouri. Yeah, I, I think I heard the same thing you did, and I was curious if you had any further information because I hadn't heard anything since then, but yeah, that's, that's very concerning, and I'm, I'm not sure how they identified it as, did, was there any details on how they identified it, but? Um, apparently there were calls made to the National Weather Service in, in Kansas City and throughout that area, and no, we don't, hadn't, they hadn't sent up any weather balloons because that was the first thought, you know, there was our own weather balloons. Dodge City National Weather Service sends them out regularly this time of year, but they said no, and uh, some, some guy happened to just see it when he looked out his window, and had a good camera with him and took some photos and it looks like something probably hadn't seen before. I really haven't heard anything other than what you mentioned. Uh, I have no Thank information. Thank you being uh, I'm ex Air Force, of yes. course, and I, I did uh, air defense, so it's sort of a special area for me. Uh, I always think that there's a lot more that's known by government authorities and military authorities than we're being told. Uh, I'd love to have that thing brought down so we could find out what information is being acquired and really by whom. But I, I have to, despite my uh, often uh, doubting this administration, I do think there are smart people uh, behind the scenes in the NSA and other agencies that uh, will do the right thing. It makes me think uh, Senator, U.S. Senator uh, Jerry Moran was in Hayes last Friday as we're you uh, and and then he had a town hall meeting uh, afterwards, and that was one of the things that he kind of emphasized that he he feels like that China is the biggest adversary of the United States now, and he you know talked about that quite a bit, and it was very interesting. And then this just happens when those they did say that the uh, they didn't name anybody, but authorities with the government said they did not, would not shoot it down because of danger to, potential danger to people on the ground. So that's the latest I heard. Interesting. And why Kansas? Maybe it's just because we're right in the middle. I don't know. Well, let's go to the phones. We have another person with us this evening who would like to make a comment and talk to our uh, legislators or ask a question. We have Nick from Russell on the phone. Nick, you're on. Yes, um, I would like to ask the panel what their thoughts are regarding the state workforce and the condition that it's in. I know over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of issues with, you know, low staff at all various agencies and that sort of thing. And with the labor market the way it is, what are their thoughts about the current state of things? And is there anything they think that needs to be done about that? I think that's an issue that's been... Uh across the United States too. And I know we've talked about it in Kansas. Would you like to take that, Senator Bellinger? You know, I, I would just uh, tell Nick that, you know, uh, I've been to several conferences over the summer and this is across the United States. It's nothing unique to Kansas. It's, it's our neighbor state to the north, the south, all sides. It, it's it's, it's, a, it's a, a problem across the country. And, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, figuring out exactly why or how, you know, it seems like maybe some folks that were close to retirement or were retired were doing some of these jobs in the past and have decided that they're going to full-time retire. I don't know. I, it, it, it seems like uh, we've got that same problem, like I said, from state to state. So I, I really, I don't know. I know it's uh, a concern. You know, we had a, a new uh, Apex project announced yesterday and mm -hmm. need for 2,000 more employees. And 
you know, I, I asked, I said, you know, where are these people, you know, going to come from? You know, and, and I know we're going to work through uh, Wichita State and, and, the, the, and Wichita Tech and, and, you know, try to figure out some of these workforce programs. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I hear this all the time. So I, I, I don't have the silver bullet. <laughs> I do think the governor proposed a 5% uh, across the board pay increase. Obviously, we, that hasn't been dealt with by the legislature. But that's what we're seeing in the Social Services Budget uh, Committee. And again, you're exactly right. This workforce issue is pervasive. Uh, we, we do what we can to uh, encourage people to stay in these career fields. It's not always about money. And you've probably seen ads even now about uh, daycare providers uh, because that's an economic development issue. Yes. Uh, and we're trying to promote that field, uh, you know, modestly paid, but there are uh, it sweeteners or enhancers as we call them in, Top in Topeka to try to get more money into that space because we, we can't have workers if we don't have daycare for their, their family members. So it's, it's a big issue and I agree Senator it's not just a Kansas issue. And Representative Smith it, it might be even more uh, tight the, the people who are available to work and obviously daycare in western Kansas and northwest Kansas. I know even in uh, Hayes, which of course is bigger than Weskin, it is a real problem that people are talking about it all the time. Everywhere you turn, employees being wanted to hire and uh, the money apparently is better than it used to be. Pay, most places paying better than minimum wage and yet we still have this, this huge gap. We do, and you know that's it's a problem in Topeka, it's a problem in Atwood, it's a problem in Dodge City. It doesn't matter the size of the town or the the rural or rural versus urban areas. Uh, it's a problem everywhere. I know government likes to sometimes brag about the unemployment rate, but people need to keep in mind that that that's just measuring the people that are looking for jobs that can't find them. That takes out the people that have either retired or quit and not looking for work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I attended a economic uh, outlook conference the other day and there there was a phrase mentioned you know it, it's usually the the unemployment problem is is where they've got jobs but nobody's wanting to to apply for those jobs because they're underpaid the money is there businesses are doing well they they can't find the people you know even even with good wages sometimes the workforce just isn't there it's it's almost a population uh, workforce population issue where uh, it was really fallout from COVID. Uh, a lot of people either lost their jobs, lost their businesses. There's a lot of, of businesses that, that closed permanently due to COVID. Those businesses take time. You know, they, they instantly, in the period of COVID, all shut down. It takes a while for those businesses to kind of right. fill that void and, and get back up to speed where they were. Uh, so sometimes when you see some of the statistics from government saying, oh, unemployment was this during COVID and now it sits back up to where it was. Well, that's not a real accurate measure because our workforce, the total number of people in the workforce is still down. And being one of them, the baby boomer generation, which is huge, getting ready to retire and that will make a big impact as well. I think that's already being effect, you know, feeling the effect there. Right. You're not that old yet, but thank you. <laughs> the rest of us are thinking about it. Let's talk elections. There have been a, a couple of bills that uh, have been, I think they're Senate bills, is that correct? Uh, I, and House bills. And House, okay. So both sides are talking about yeah. this. Um, again, people, uh, some of the legislators that are proponents of this are, are hoping, hoping to. Um, keep things above board and coming up with ways to make sure that elections are held responsibly and people who are opposed to it are saying no it's just a way to keep some people from voting so we're talking about let's start with you uh, representative Clifford that these there's a couple of things especially one of them when it comes to mail balloting there is kind of a, a leeway period to allow them to come into a county clerk's office and be counted but they're talking about reducing that time now that's correct. Uh, our Republican caucus met on Wednesday and uh, Secretary of State Scott Schwab came in to talk to us specifically about elections. You know, in Kansas, we, we're rated now the fourth or fifth best state for election security. Uh, we, we don't have people committing gross fraud in elections uh, and I'm very confident about our elections and I want our voters to know 
your vote counts. And that's, for me, the part I don't like about folks who talk about uh, fraudulent elections in Kansas. We, we don't have criminals affecting our elections. Uh, Mail-in ballots do present a concern. We have signature ID, we, we have rules, and I think we should abide by them. Uh, when you're a county commissioner, like uh, Representative Smith and I, I don't know, Rick, were you ever a county commissioner? Because we, city. city. We, we canvass the votes. That's who does right. the voting canvass. And we make every attempt to not disenfranchise a voter. So I feel like our Kansas system is set up so that everyone can vote and everyone votes, everyone who votes, their vote counts. Uh, Mail-in ballots continue to be concerned because of ballot harvesting. So someone going to a nursing home and getting 20 ballots and then bringing them in, we're limiting that to five, so you're not gonna be able to do that. The drop boxes are a concern. In Finney County, we have one, it's right in front of the clerk's office, and in most counties, they are well monitored. So there is legislation to cut down on the numbers. Some have even proposed zero ballot drop boxes, but you know, shift workers need an opportunity to bring in their ballots. So again, I, I don't believe we should stop using drop boxes, and Secretary, uh, Secretary of State Schwab does not either. Uh, so I, again, I want our citizens to know we have very secure elections in Kansas. If I can just add a few things on to, on to what Representative Clifford has already said, you know, one of the things that's a bill in the House, I'm not sure if it's in the Senate, is this three-day grace period on mail-in ballots. Uh, after Election Day, they will still get the mail, and for three days, they will accept those ballots. Now, theoretically, those ballots need to be postmarked on Election Day or prior. I've worked for the Postal Service before. I, I understand that, you know, in Northwest Kansas, our mail goes up to North Platte. I think Southwest Kansas, it goes down to New Mexico. Santa Fe. Santa Fe. Huh? And you cannot guarantee, I don't know if anybody's checked their mail recently, their first class stuff, sometimes it doesn't get a postmark. So you could have mailed that ballot on Monday, it went to whatever processing facility, didn't get postmarked, didn't make it back to your county clerk's office until Wednesday, if that three-day grace period is eliminated, that ballot is no longer good. Even though it was technically filled out and mailed mm. prior to election day, uh, that's one of the dangers of getting rid of that. Obviously, one of the dangers of keeping that, I'll, I'll play both sides here, is someone could watch the elections Tuesday night, think, oh my goodness, that's, I, don't, I don't want that person to win, fill their ballot out, mail it on Wednesday, maybe it gets returned to the county clerk uh, Thursday, that's still within the three-day window. Technically, that val ballot should not count, but it will if it doesn't get postmarked and they see that it was mailed late. Uh, there's there's sides to both of those stories there. And on to the point on ballot harvesting, uh, we passed a law a couple years ago or last year, I can't remember, on, on ballot harvesting to make sure that one person can't turn in a whole bunch of ballots. Uh, there's concern about the safety of the drop boxes that are installed, but there's, there's still ballot boxes out there. They're called the, the United States Postal Service, the big bins that you can put, in, put mail in. Those aren't secure either. Somebody could still go in. Uh, we passed that law trying to reduce the abuse of ballot harvesting where one person goes around and collects all, a whole bunch of ballots, as many as they can usually under the, the guise of, oh, by the way, vote for this guy, this guy, and this guy, or they're, maybe they're going around collecting ballots with their candidate's T-shirt on, so people are, they see that, it's kind of electioneering in, to an extent mm -hmm. where they, they're trying to encourage people to fill out their ballots and, oh, by the way, vote for this guy. Uh, we're just, it, that's not really a, a fair system, so we were trying to cut back on that, but it really creates some security concerns, because how do you enforce that then? Unless you have a, a way, you know, I go to Redbox and rent a DVD, I have to scan my, my driver's license or my, my debit card or something. Maybe we have some type of ballot box system where you have to scan your ID because you can only uh, remit five ballots. I, I don't know what the answer there is. And then that still doesn't solve the problem of somebody who does still do the ballot harvesting, but yet they go dump them all in the post office box. Postal Service has no idea how many people have uh, distributed that if it was one person or five people that turned those in and once the county clerk gets them they have no way of knowing who mailed those so we'll see 
It'll be interesting. We have uh, another phone caller we would invite to participate this evening. Uh, Thomas is on the phone from Hutchinson. Thomas, you have a comment or a question of our legislators this evening? I do. How are you guys doing tonight? Very well, thank you. My question um, regarding transportation is, is so the governor and her budget um, announced that she wanted to put $220 million um, into a fund to help local communities um, leverage capital to um, their own infrastructure projects or some of their own local priorities. And so my question to you is, what are some of the transportation or other infrastructure projects that you'd like to see uh, KDOT tackle in your area or what your local communities are asking for? Good question. Transportation is important, especially in rural areas of western Kansas or, or wherever it may happen to be. Senator Billinger, let's start with you. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, thank you for calling in tonight. You know, uh, there is money in the budget for uh, transportation. and. Uh, basically, uh, the way I understand this is the federal government in the new uh, program that they just passed that's coming out here has put money in there for transportation. And many of these call for a match from your local community. And some of the smaller communities in particular, and even large ones if they have large projects, sometimes don't have the money for the match. So these grants would be available for different communities to use for their match so we can draw down a large amount of, of federal dollars for these programs. So that's basically the way I understand the grant program working. That would be helpful. Representative Smith? Oh, that, that was an excellent okay. answer. I, I couldn't <laughs> add anything better. All right. Uh, and how about you, Representative Clifford, anything else? Well, if I was king, I'd fix Highway 156 because I have to, <laughs> it goes 130 miles through my district and I have to drive it to Topeka every week. It's dangerous. You know, and, and I'm from Dodge City originally and, and I'm down in that area. And that is, in the years that I've driven between Dodge City and Hayes, incredible increased truck traffic. And I know that there's been attention paid to, to the, some of the roads there to uh, accommodate that. Unfortunately, there have been fatalities in that area too that seem to be uh, because of the increased traffic and the two lane highways. And they do take a look at that and try to improve it. Is there enough money being, uh, being made available to improve situations like that? Well, I, I, there's never enough. There are always you know, limited resources for all the asks, but I think a lot of it has gone to the eastern part of the state. And as you probably know, we are few here in the West. Uh, <coughs> there are as many representatives in Johnson County as there are west of Wichita. So uh, one thing Representative uh, Smith and I have to do is make good friends in eastern Kansas. I'm sure Senator Billinger is really good at it since he's an appropriator now uh, because we, we need their votes to get some of the, those resources out, out west here where we really need it. And I don't think folks appreciate what the trucks do. Uh, and, and the impact that has on our roads and, and the safety concerns. Uh, I respect truck drivers. I have a son-in-law who's a long haul driver, uh, they're, they're, but there are a lot of them. And uh, we need better roads to handle that traffic if we're gonna, going to continue to grow our economy out west. And you've got to have those trucks. That's just a huge part of it, absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about uh, maybe an update on the sports betting that went live in the fall, September, I think it was. How's it going? Are we making money? Are people happy with it? Is anybody cheating? What's the situation? Representative Smith. I, I, I'm not really sure if we've <laughs> had any reports. Is, is, have there been some revenue estimates um, for Boys and Means? Yes, you know, it, it's not near as much money as you would think, ah. you know, and, and, and we said that all along, you know, and it, it depends on the, the number of people that participate. And, and, you know, this next week when the Super Bowl comes, I'm sure that'll be one of the better uh, revenue uh, days for the state of Kansas. But, uh, you know, it's it's a couple million dollars. You know, it, it's not not a, a, a big deal. I mean, it's, uh, it's where it's at right now. So. And where does that money actually go? Uh, it, it goes into a, a, a gaming f uh, fund, a uh, fund for uh, 
just like the, the revenues we get from the casinos. And some of it's earmarked for different things, you know. Um, can't think right off the top. The project that got slipped into the bill last year. There's a little bit of an earmark to, to create a professional stadium in the eastern part of the state, ah. presumably to attract a, a Missouri-based team uh, across the border. But again, as Senator Billinger's right, it's not a lot of money. And there is an interest in, in uh, you know, I, I, both the Kansas City Chiefs and the Royals. I, I've been hearing this for about a week now, that, that they are seriously considering coming to Kansas. So I guess we'll have to wait and see. That'd be exciting. We'll see. All right. Um, I wanted to find out, uh, Dr. Clifford, you were saying before we got started uh, talking a little bit about being on the Social Services Budget Committee and and the Health Committee, and you and, and I know you too, Representative Villinger, were in Hayes for the ribbon cutting of the Camber uh, Mental Health Services for youth, for children and youth, and something that is unfortunately we've found is just so important to all of Kansas, but particularly to Western Kansas again, so that children and their families don't have to drive to Eastern Kansas for services. Is this something that, uh, where, where do we stand with this? Is there more c money coming into mental health issues and situations for, especially for the children of Kansas? Yeah, absolutely, and I agree with you. That's a wonderful facility in Hayes, uh, a long time coming. I served seven years on the Compass Mental Health, Community Mental Health Center Board in Finney County, and you're right, we're sending kids to Wichita and Kansas City, and it's tough on the kids, but it's probably tougher on the families to go that far to take care of their loved ones. So uh, that was a great event with Senator Moran there last week, and I'm really excited to see that facility open. Uh, for adults, uh, there is money uh, that has already been appropriated by the state uh, for a, a mental health hospital in the Wichita area. Uh, as you know, we have Oswatomi back east and Larned State Hospital here in the west, uh, but that south central area of the state has a large population uh, great needs and uh, it looks like we're going to be able to get a, a mental health facility in, in Sedgwick County uh, eventually. So I, I think all of us have experienced a lot more attention to mental health uh, in the schools, uh, in the rural areas. Um, unfortunately, we have one of the highest teen suicide rates in, in the nation here in our state. It's, mm -hmm. it's a big problem. Um, you know, for me, another focus of it is, is the opioid epidemic. I've started to say we are poisoning people. They don't overdose, they get poisoned with opioids. Um, you know, are some of those uh, suicides, are those mental health issues? Uh, there's a lot of attention and you'll see a lot more money devoted to uh, both mental health and combating the opioid epidemic. Gentlemen, we are running out of time this evening. I thank you so much for joining us and appreciate the work that you do for us in Topeka. Thank you for joining us this evening. We want to say thank you again to our partners, ITC and the Docking Institute of Public Affairs at Fort Hayes State University. Thank you to uh, Smoky Hills Public Television for their assistance on our program. And thank you for watching this evening. I'm your host, Becky Kaiser. Good night. In our increasingly electrified society, that's where a resilient grid matters most. ITC Great Plains builds, operates, and maintains electric transmission infrastructure, connecting consumers to lower cost energy sources to power our energy future. That means safe, secure, reliable electricity for those we serve. Learn more at itc-holdings.com.